ジョイトスパーキャスト変革への道こんにちは伊藤ジョイトです今日は日本でエコビレージを作ろうとしているダウを紹介したいと思います We have Michelle Wong and William Skinner here from Akia Dao Welcome to the show Thank you so much, it's good to be here Thanks for having us Can you guys tell me a little bit about what Akia Dao is? Of course.、Um, so, Akia Dao is basically an initiative to be able to renovate Akias into flourishing communities for human creativity,、um, builders, art installations, permaculture experiments, et cetera. We want to have this be really the ground for a lot of new experiments and a lot of co governance initiatives to occur. So, we're、um, very much about you know, having these empty. Tabula rasa、uh, sheets of paper and turning them into a collective、um, code. So, what would you say? Tabula rasa. Tabula rasa, yeah. So, tabula rasa is a kind of philosophical term for blank canvas or blank slate.、Um, oftentimes, it's actually used in、um, context of a person like being born into the world and having a blank slate and then all of their experiences be able to kind of shape the person, the, their views and perspectives for what they are. And so, it's like over time, we evolve with our experiences and we evolve with. Our interactions, and、um, we think that this house is going to be like a living, tangible artifact of every single person that's come inside of it as well. And, and you use the word co governance. What, what、yes. does that mean? So, co governance is a great question.、Um, co governance is basically being able to facilitate,、um, especially, the, um, especially the kind of like allocation of public goods、um, among a collective of people. And so, how do we co govern and、um, co create the space? Meaning, like, can we also collectively decide what happens to it?、Um, can we vote and be able to organize ourselves、um, in both the digital and physical realm for us to turn this physical living artifact that represents the community into things that we really believe that you know, can emerge from it? When did you start it and how did you start it? Yeah, yeah, for sure.、Um, so, we actually started the ideation process around.、Um, I would say probably this was February or March.、Um, so, how, how Will and I met was actually、um, through a group interview for a Web3 co- cohort called Kernel.、Um, and so, it's a, it's a Web3 cohort that brings creatives, builders, artists,、um, people together to learn more about this whole like, decentralized governance、um, and to be able to understand more and build projects together in Web3. And so we were put in the same group interview.、Um, and you o k n we were both answering questions. And we're like, well, like, this person is really smart. And so Will re- reached out to me on Twitter afterwards, being like, hey, like, I, I think like, we could be friends. And then we started just talking about a lot of different things, ranging from like,、um, eco villages and eco consciousness、uh, into, into like, real estate and our love for Japan. And I was like, oh, actually, like, there's the IKEA situation in Japan that I've been looking at for like, the last two or three years. I sent him a link and then he's like, he sends me a Google Doc like 30 minutes later, being like, hey, like, I think we can turn this into a DAO. And then we just ended up starting this.、Um, so it's, it's been quite a journey so far. And, and can you tell me a little bit of you know, like your backgrounds and what you were doing up until then? Of course.、Um, so I'll, I'll go ahead and start.、Um, so my background is actually, I first started off in medicine. So, I was pre med. I like in third grade, I wanted to be a non interventional cardiovascular surgeon, and that was it. <laughs> and then, learning more about the medical infrastructure in、uh, high school and college, I realized that、um, there is a lot more inefficiencies and more systemic、um, infrastructure than there were. Like, there was no sor- shortage of smart people. It was very much like an infrastructure problem. So, I started thinking a lot about systems. Um, ended up going into finance. And so my first job out of undergraduate was、um, working in iBanking at Goldman. And I was there for a little bit, like got my finance in, got my like understanding of systems in. And then I ended up going back into healthcare entrepreneurship. So working in product at a healthcare company,、uh, startup in San Francisco.、Um, did that, realized that like product was more managerial, missed my creative side, artistic side. So then I left to do creative sabbatical. Um, and become an artist. So now I'm a digital artist、uh, and I incorporate like technology as well as like science initiatives to be able to understand more about human flourishing. And so this is, I feel like, one of the initiatives that's very much exploring that. Did you ever live in Japan?、Um, so I've spent probably, this is my fourth time in Japan so far.、Um, I've lived here for probably a month before maximum. So I think this time will probably be my longest time in Japan. 
Um, but every time I've come back, I felt like a a lot of like resonance with the culture, and a lot of my friends are Japanese. And yeah, I the last time I was here, I was actually um, shadowing a, a chef here to learn more about microbiotics. So my the, I I used to I have been talking about you guys, mm-hmm. and the story that I said was that you were a Chinese designer living in Japan who couldn't get back in because of visa restrictions for COVID. <laughs> so I, it's almost true, it's but almost not true. not really. <laughs> I, was, I was trying to get in Japan <laughs> for basically about like six months last year. So yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know where I got that story. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so, so it's a good one. Though. It's a good one. Yeah. It, 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 yeah. Yeah. It, so, so William, would you ready to tell us about yeah. your background? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I've been in the crypto space for about eight years now. Um, long, long ago when there were a few use cases and kind of as the ecosystem began to develop, I got more and more interested in the um, like trading side of things. I was also gravitating toward finance as a lost young man who uh, getting more and more into crypto, I started trading for a few years um, and then eventually I'd I'd done a trading that I got recruited by a private equity firm to run their crypto and uh, crypto trade uh, investment and research arm. I did a lot of entrepreneurship for a long time, started my first company like freshman year of university and just like became completely obsessed. Um, so I was a car audio components manufacturing company, um, spent about three and a half years there. Uh, we got acquired in February of 2019. And the first thing I did actually, uh, I Googled like, what do you do when you sell a company? And it was just like, go travel. Um, <laughs> so I booked a one-way ticket to Tokyo and went to Tokyo like three days later and, uh, did like a bit of a world tour for a bit but um that like my brain exploded when i got to japan i was just like this is the most interesting like experience of humanity of all time um and then yeah basically was uh working in the web3 space working in um impact and solar got connected to michelle um and became entirely too obsessed with the ikea problem and uh here we are so so i remember somewhere some so connected to Akita, I heard the term solar punk and um, I kind of imagined what it is, but I don't think our listeners would know. Is that, it would, are you in that community and what is a solar punk and is it, does it have anything to do with Akita? Yeah, I would say we're probably now more like adjacently related to solar punk. Mm-hmm. Um, I would say that the solar punk community is a lot about like, um, if you've heard the kind of like aesthetic of cyberpunk, it's like, oh, like you go in with all these like really like new shiny tech tools uh, and solarpunk is kind of like a lightened, uh, more environmentally friendly version of that. Um, but it's still very, you know, like, hey, like we're punks. <laughs> but I think that um, it's it, it feels very much like the vibe of wanting to create alternative lifestyles, alternative paths. And I think that's kind of like where the the punk adjacency comes in. In solar, meaning um, we we want to have like more something that is environmentally sustainable um, as well as integratable within the community itself. So having the entire ethos of the project from inside and out be very focused on restoration, regeneration, revitalization. Um, so that's that's kind of like the adjacency to it. But if you look at solar punk um, kind of on Google Images, you'll see a lot of like the floating castle vibes, which honestly like entirely is really, really cool. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, but I think we would probably be more like a little bit more solar than punk. So, so eco village fits you guys better. Yeah, I would say like sustainably conscious, like creative residents. Um, but we do want to like, we, you know, we're starting out with one house first that is meant to be a, a flourishing home for creatives and builders. And potentially if we're able to um, uh, expand to more houses, we'd want to like continue to do permaculture experiments yeah. and like have farming plots and have like all that kind of stuff. But And co-governance sounds a little hippie though, right? It, sounds, it probably does. <laughs> so it's kind of like, it yeah. sounds a little bit like a modern commune. Is what's What would be different than say a hippie commune and what you guys are trying to do? That's an excellent question. Yeah. What is the difference between a Kia Dow and a hippie commune? Yeah, yeah. I may have to get back to you on that one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. I think uh, a lot more technologically advanced. Blocking. Yeah, there's yeah, Web3. Wrong. You're not in a... There's hippies on the block. No. Um, a lot more technologically advanced. Hopefully a lot cleaner. Um, <laughs> what else? So you're saying Stuart Brand is unclean. Hippie? <laughs> we <can> hips? Oh. <laughs> you say hippies, hippies are dirty. Um, I would say, like, in addition to that, um, I feel like a lot of communes and co-ops that I've seen are very much localized. 
So you go to a commune, um, they're very focused on like, hey, like they, a lot of them are actually like quite coordinated well, um, mm-hmm. where people are happy, the communities are flourishing, the plants are green, like people are taking care of each other and taking care of public spaces. Um, but I think something that sets us apart is that we're actually like, even though we are creating a local like real estate um, like place where people can actually go and flourish and that in itself is similar to communes. I think when we uh, continue to expand and potentially move into more Kia, um, these sort of local communities can actually share practices um, that they find and understand with each other. And um, in that effect, hopefully be able to have like some sort of like cybernetic um, connection across all these local places. So uh, more of like a uh, maybe like distributed or decentralized commune that can share practices with each other. Cyber hippies. Cyber hippies. Exactly. That's this is it. (laughs) New court. They're well put. Say, there's a great paper called "The Tyranny of Structurelessness" Mm. by Joe Friedman, who was a feminist who hung out in hippie communes, and so, and what was a really interesting um, story about how when you sort of remove all structure, you actually get sort of the worst. You get sort of like the Lord of the Flies kind of thing happening. In fact, the casualness becomes very political because you have no rules and no structure. So, yeah. so maybe that's kind of the thing that's different from co-governance and like structurelessness is that you have structure, but it's more decentralized, right? For sure, for sure. We we definitely don't necessarily want like everything to be structureless. Um, yeah. I think um, you know we're just also referencing uh, the game Twitch Place Pokemon. Um, if you've heard of that, right. yeah. it's basically just like. Um, I think this software engineer hooked up a Twitch account to like a Pokemon game, and every person that could watch the Twitch, uh, the Twitch stream and comment on it, you can say like up, right, left, down, A, B, start, and that would actually like every message would be a vote in terms of like what mm-hmm. what the person actually did in the game, or like it kind of consolidated to like be a series of um, controls that you know people actually put and like. You know, Will was saying, you know, like we we had both watched this and um, both participated in this, and um, there is like one point where I went on and and I watched, and it was just like this this guy going in circles, and we'll have the same experience as well. Yeah, <laughs> just like moving up and down for five minutes, and that's like kind of what happens in like a completely structureless society. Well, like let's say instead of like one person monopolizing the Pokemon game and streaming it. It almost becomes like, hey, like maybe people vote on who gets to play every ten minutes, mm-hmm. um, based off of like the credentials. So yep. that's kind of what we mean by like co-governance, where we're able to decentralize it, and so we're allowing for more opportunities for emergence mm-hmm. um, and serendipity, but also it's not chaos. Yeah. And I guess blockchain helps, right? Because you have all kinds of governance tools that can yeah. create structure without people. Mm-hmm. Yeah, right. yeah, and I and I think entirely like one of the things that we really want to explore with this project is that human behavior is so complex, like it can go in a variety of directions, like in our Kia Dao project, like how do we choose on what project that we even in, uh, endeavor into next? So like, you know, do we focus on sustainability? Do we focus on art? Um, I think there's like a kind of wide range of things, but I think this project will very much be a learning for all of us to understand these governance systems that are more complex and not also one dimensional. But, but so, so your idea is you're gonna buy an Akia mm-hmm. in a village and then a bunch of people come in in sort of a non hippie way, turn it into a <laughs> co working living space with lots of re- re- like renewable energy and like organic farms and stuff like that. Is that sort of how I should imagine it? Yeah, yeah, definitely pretty similar ideas. Um, I think one piece to note is the sort of cohort based model. So it's different groups of people coming in at different times. Yep. So in each instance, you can have a group of people coming together and forming kind of like a closer community. I think if you have this constant wheel of people coming and going, mm-hmm. it's difficult to kind of like form those bonds that are necessary to to keep a group together. Um, but by making that like right three months, three months, three months, you can have these like individual um, strong communities. I think that also leads to this sense that over the course of your three months, you should do work that is both for yourself and both for the community. Mm-hmm. So we like the idea of different courts leaving behind artifacts or in some way expanding the space, making the space better. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that over time, when you look at that on the three to five year time scale, you have this kind of like uh, very organically, artistically divergent vision of IKEA coming together of this, these groups of people coming through, each of them are making it better and better. And eventually you get this like truly curious house um, like 
but but buying a house and doing all this stuff sounds like it's going to cost a lot of money. Like where where's the money come from? Yeah, so we're looking at a variety of fundraising tools. I think there's a lot of capital in Web3 that is looking for strong solutions to build community. I think there's a lot of talk about community in Web3, but I think it's still a fairly unsolved problem in that no one's really cracked, like, how do you really bring these people together for a common goal outside of just, like, incentives, right? So everyone's like, oh, well, communities just, like, make a bounty program. It's like, you're just paying them. Like, they're not really a community. Um, so I think Akia Dao provides this opportunity for people to come together in the real world. Um, and I've been you know, traveling around for a few months, I've gone to a bunch of different crypto conferences. And I think that meeting people in the real world is such a completely different experience than it is meeting people online, right? Like anyone can DM, DM you on Twitter. Um, but staying in like a community house over the course of a conference for two weeks with someone like really forges a different kind of bond. Um, so we've been talking with protocols that would be interested in potentially renting out rooms of the Akia to um, host their members. I think the second piece is when you bring this really diverse and intriguing community of people, right? Artists, builders, hackers, all sorts of awesome people together in a space that becomes a space that people want to be in. Um, so you have the protocols sort of funding uh, individual rooms, perhaps purchasing leases. You also have uh, ecosystems that are looking to fund um, public goods, looking to fund uh, climate positive efforts. Um, and finally, there's the idea of an NFT membership which I think was, we explored that very deeply about a year ago when NFTs were really hot. I think it's still a very effective mechanism. I think there's a lot of really cool benefits that an NFT brings. I think in this case, the one that I'm personally most excited about is the ability of an NFT to balance supply and demand. You purchase a house and you release a batch of NFTs to live in that house as people- So memberships. Yeah, yes, NFT memberships. So the NFT allows you to come and habitate the space, um, you know, application process and other pieces, but effectively that's the mechanism. If you want to come to the house, you need the NFT. As the house becomes more and more popular, the value of the NFT rises. And as people trade that, we capture a percentage of that, right? Secondary sales or royalties. Um, and what's really cool there is it's like, how do you fund renovations of the house? How do you fund future purchases of additional homes? Well, that mostly comes from the initial launch of the NFTs. You bring in that capital to purchase the first house. And then as that becomes more and more valuable, that's traded back and forth more and you have more secondaries coming in. So as demand increases, which is the price of the, and of the limited number of NFTs increasing, supply can also increase in tandem by increasing the size of the house or purchasing additional houses. So you have this really unique supply and demand balancing mechanism, right? If, if a Kia DAO became huge and people were selling these for many multiples of what they paid for them, that capital would be flowing back to us. And then we could build more, uh, we could expand the community and then I mean, more, yeah. in tandem, then the NFT becomes even more valuable because it's not access to yeah. one house, it's access to five houses. And I think the key piece of that is if you do it right, it eliminates speculation, right? Because yeah. what you don't want is a bunch of people buying a bunch, pumping it and dumping it, right? Yep. And if, if they know that the price can go down as supply goes up and that it, the NFT is just a what supply regulator, mm -hmm. then I think that's, that's cause, cause I could get back to your incentives things. I mean, I, you've both been in financial institutions of some sort. So mm -hmm. I personally think that incentivizing people to show up to make money and then using other incentives to work together is worth a lot worse than incentivizing people to get together in a purely non-financial ways, but then using financial things to get them to operate well together. You know, yeah. and it's yeah. like yeah. bribing your little sister to do her homework is okay, but you know, paying somebody to be your spouse is probably not, doesn't work as well, right? <laughs> <No>. <laughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's very much like a people first, community first kind of initiative. And then the product is, the profit is very much a byproduct and it's like, you know, if a lot of people feel excited about it, then the profit is a byproduct that goes into expanding the community. But like we, even if we just end up with like one Akio with like a really, really solid group of people, like that, that would be a successful project in itself yep. as well. So we're not like always optimizing for, for profit. It's not like we're going and fundraising and buying like 10 houses and turning into like a real estate organization, but Out of maybe like nine of them are like, <laughs> yeah, it's like, but maybe nine of them are empty, but it's very much about having it be organic. Um, so similar to Will said about having supply and demand actually match the real supply and demand and not trying to like 
cost shift or That's do cool. any financial mechanisms. Yeah. I think it should be reflective of the actual community engagement. Neat. Um, and and so you're both here in in Japan. And you're gonna what what what's 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 why you're here? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we're here to meet awesome communities. We've been able to meet a lot of amazing communities um, and build their spaces. And so we're touring uh, not only people that are building in Web3, but also art residencies, art installations. Um, we were going to like a decentralized gallery, um, New York, that also has like a Web3 component as well. So we're also very much um, going on a tour um, to visit IKEAs and to visit potential properties that we might want to, you know, take in as like the first IKEA for IKEA Dow House. Um, and so after we uh, leave Tokyo, which is, I think, actually in two days, um, we're going to Hayama uh, and then Hokone Yugawara, um, Osaka, Kyoto, and then Fukuoka to visit some real estate around there. So we're really, really excited to see, you know, like potential homes and just be like, hey, like, do we see ourselves living there? Yeah, I think the the final piece there is just engaging with the culture. Mm. I, I Every time I think of Japan, the first thought is just like, this is the most interesting place in the world. It's such a unique experience. Like, well, I'll say I, I grew up in the middle of nowhere in Wisconsin. So like the cultural difference between small town Wisconsin and like Tokyo is like, we're just gonna like this is a, it, another planet doesn't cover it. Like Mars is is more similar to me than here, um, and it's just like right. This is this is like this is such a unique expression of human life in such a, a different and incredible place. And um, I think there's so much to learn and so much to experience from from being here and engaging with the culture. I think it's also really important when you talk about kind of foreigners coming to a place. Uh, for Akiyado, right? This is international communities, people from all over the world um, coming to Japan. I think it's really important to understand the culture, be respectful of the culture, and engage with it in a meaningful and long-lasting way. Mm -hmm. um, I see Akiyado not as a five-year project, but a 25, 50-year project, right? We're buying this permanent residence. Um, this is a place that we want to inhabit in a very like engaging and respectful way. And I think it, it's just so important to understand especially when you're coming to a rural community like what do they value what are they about and like how do they feel about us being there and how can we kind of like make that as harmonious of a relationship as possible so yeah here we are how many people are in your community and where are they and are they all coming to this poor little town <laughs> <laughs> hopefully not yeah 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 hopefully not all at once um but you know like we have about 700 people more than 700 people now on our discord um it's funny because like I feel like we we've talked about the project through word of mouth, um, but we haven't like you know put out any like serious marketing or advertisements. Um, but people have still been joining every single day, which to us is like, whoa! Like people will really resonate with this thing. Like, how do we come together and build something in real life? Um, I think the DIY communities are increasing. I think the nomad communities are increasing. I think the you know like Japanese cultural communities are increasing. I think we have about 300, 200 to 300 people in our Discord that are actually like native Jap Jap Japanese speakers or living in Japan. Um, so that to us is like, well, like people are the Discord and it's like, oh, like Hiragana. And I'm like, what? <laughs> like, that's so cool. Sure. Um, but in terms of the people that are actually like here in Japan um, that are going to be visiting the IKEAs, so it's um, me, Will, our core contributor, Johnny. On um, one of our potential investors, who's also part of a um, kind of like protocol looking to potentially sponsor a house. And then uh, we also have a friend who uh, kind of like is a construction guru, has built houses before and can help us inspect and really understand what restoration efforts would be needed in order to make it livable. What's your roadmap timing wise? Yeah, so I would say uh, general broad strokes of the roadmap is spending December and um, probably like the first two weeks of January doing our tour, uh, meeting communities, understanding more about the culture. Um, and then most of the people on, on the team will like, you know, like go back to like um, their current lives uh, as outside of Japan. I personally am probably going to be staying. Um, I would like to really brush up on my Japanese. Um, I've been writing a lot of emails to local governments and I'm like Googling everything. <laughs> so like, it would be really, really amazing to um, be able to become truly fluent in Japanese as well. So I'll be focused on that, um, but we'll hopefully have a house in mind um, that we're able to find uh, this trip, if not, you know, like in the next month or two, and then start fundraising um, 
sometime February, March, um, and then hoping to purchase a house by like May or so, and then start renovation processes over summer. Um, so hopefully bringing in our first cohorts of builders and people that are savvy in construction, like Richard, <laughs> and um, really start that process. So we're, we're hoping for a summer start. Well, the, the good timing is now with the AI arms race, probably by the time you're here next year, you won't have to learn to read and write Japanese oh. <laughs> as much, right? Yeah. Except local governments, they give you things on paper. Totally, totally. And then I'll like, you know, click a, something on my air glass and it'll like read in English. But I think there's also a lot of uh, cultural benefits as well to, to learn Italian, Japanese. Yeah. Yeah. So much lost in translation. There's so much like, for example, like honorifics or being able to add, you know, politeness to statements, I think is, is really important yeah. um, for me to like grasp as well. So yeah. I'm excited to store all of that. Yeah. So what, what's what been hard? What what have been your hurdles and stuff? Yeah. Many. It's a difficult <laughs> yeah. project. Yes. Um, I think the, the language is definitely a very big one. Um, it's exceedingly difficult to um, basically like engage with uh, basically everything, right? It's <laughs> not, a, not a super like English friendly place. And I think all of the best stuff is very much like no English menu type places um also the kind of government and bureaucracy makes things fairly, fairly challenging the process of purchasing an IKEA is not a simple or straightforward process and i think there are many many layers to the challenge that is the IKEA problem it's not just that there's all of these homes it's that these homes are uh not often you know extraordinarily well categorized or um placed on any meaningful ledger system right there's just sort of a lot of um, fragmentation in the industry, especially each prefecture, each area has its own um, has its own kind of way of doing things, and they don't often line up, and they're very, very seldom for foreigner friendly. So there's a lot of sort of like middlemen and intermediaries that you need to go through in order to engage. Yeah, I would say um, probably another large challenge that we've seen ourselves face is kind of like the financialization of the project or fundraising the project. Um, this is very much a a project that doesn't have like the 10x like you know like you know, it, like the presentation pitch that you give to vcs it's like everything is up into the right and they're like you know we're not going for like we're not optimizing for roi um it's not like really a project that we think will like have insane amounts of returns and the same amount like that a SaaS product would for vcs so i think it's it's definitely a harder pitch to find um, people and companies and initiatives that feel very aligned with, you know, like this, this more of like a social good, like public, you know, goods project. It's, it's definitely an interesting, um, like set of challenges, but also opportunities to build on like such frontier tech and have like the ground moving as we're still trying to like build a house on top of it, literally. <laughs> and so it's, um, you know, it's, it's like, oh, like what kind of like earthquake regulations do we need to like think about mm -hmm. in the metaphorical sense, right? Yep. Uh, and so I feel like there's, there's a lot of um, challenges that will, will probably like the unknown unknowns that we will only like begin to see after we start building the project. But I think it also comes with um, like the opportunities for us to like really think about this as a community together and figure out how to proceed. We, I was talking about Web three and every and DAOs and but well, what what give us a useful applications? Anybody doing it for anything other than just trying to make more money? And then I saw, yeah. I guess yes. I don't know where I saw a Kia DAO first. It may have been through Sean, but I think I saw it somewhere. And then he knew you. But it may have been Sean tweeting it, and I was like, and, try, and then like immediately into your Discord and. Mm -hmm. and uh, and uh, it was it was but 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 it, but even from the beginning it was like oh this is a really hard project <laughs> yeah yeah for sure for sure yeah, yeah, yeah it's kind of like very much a uphill battle but um I think with like the right amount of people that like it's like an uphill battle but it's like I feel like the community members are all pushing pushing each other's backs yeah. and so we're all slowly going up yeah. but also together uh, yeah I, I think that for me the the oh the meta game. Mm -hmm is um, there are a lot of local government DAOs starting. So there's the um, Yamakoshi Mura, which you guys are connected to now. And and there's like Shiwacho in Iwate. And they're all looking for purpose as well. And I think, you know, if if like DAO to DAO collaboration seems like a really interesting thing that I haven't seen enough of. Yeah. And so, I mean, you have it with like tool makers and DEXs and stuff like that, but mm -hmm. not kind of with social DAOs. So yeah. it'd be pretty cool if um, um, we can sort of see sort of, I don't know, D to D businesses. Exactly. Yeah. D to D. 
day to day business yeah. is. Yeah. And it's just like, it's so cool to see so much like we've seen how people work together in the real world and we've seen how people kind of like work together in the digital world. And it's about like, how do we like form a way where there's a unique blended hybrid that takes the best out of these two worlds and allows it to like, you know, really promote human flourishing. So yeah, Hello. I'm excited. I think in a way you could almost see IKEA DAO as DAO tooling and that we provide a physical container yeah. for people to come together and do awesome DAO stuff. Mm -hmm. um, to put it very simply, yeah, like we're, yeah, we're DAO tooling. DAO. <laughs> physical DAO tooling. Real world DAO tooling. I think, I just, I love the the intersection between uh, crypto and real world and mm -hmm. I love the intersection between crypto and climate. And one of the things mm -hmm. I like the most about IKEA DAO is like it sits pretty squarely like mm -hmm. in the middle of this three-way intersection of just like things that I find really interesting, right? Real world applications, yep. cutting edge technology and like doing good for the world mm -hmm. um, in both an environmental and a social aspect. Yep. And I think like when you have a, an organization that is aligned along the correct values and is like really driven in a direction that I feel very good about, like mm -hmm. it's, it's like Michelle said, it's like everyone's like pushing about like no one like how do you vote how like how do you root against us like we're just we just <laughs> we just want to like build a cool space for cool people to come together in a cool place like yeah what's wrong with that <laughs> <laughs> it's a thing i would want to be a part of like if i saw this on the internet i would definitely want to be a part of it and i think that like makes me really happy to you know be providing that for other people yeah i guess the the question is whether a bunch of Elderly Japanese want it to be a part of them. <laughs> true, true, true. Yeah, yeah. But I, but I, but there are a lot of communities. I think that the key thing is, and and there is kind of a reverse selection process you could do, right? So I think as you get better known in Japan, people will reach out to you. Yeah. And I think one of the things will be to find a community that wants to lean in. And I think the sort of Venn diagram of sweet spots will be cool places with cool akia, but also with communities that. Mm -hmm. It doesn't take a whole bunch of people, but but I think the thing, if you look at Shuacho or Yamakoshi, which are pretty advanced, you have a couple of key mm -hmm. people in those towns that are connected to the local government, but also understand Web3, right? Yeah. And that population should grow, I think. Exactly. Yeah. And it's so cool to see like Japan come out and um, talk about their Web3 initiatives as well. We're like, perfect. <laughs> yeah, that's good timing because we weren't timing. there when you started. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And I feel like that's been a recent development, but... Um, it's definitely something that I feel like is is really exciting for the country and also really exciting for our project. Yeah. So, so that's the other thing you have to brush up on your Japanese so you can be on all the talk shows with the Japanese <laughs> politicians. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, hopefully. Maybe one day. Maybe, like, talk to me again in a year and, like, <laughs> I'll, maybe I'll be closer to it. So, yeah, well, it'd be really fun. Michelle and William, thanks for being on the show. And uh, well, hopefully we'll keep in touch with you and update people through this podcast as you get along. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much again for having us. This was such a fun conversation. Yeah, awesome.